One question. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, if the what if the people, I mean, it's often said that the Rama, Ram mantra. I mean, so, 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 what is the meaning of the word? I mean, the Rama itself. Is there a meaning to it, or is is just a what you call localization? Uh, for concentration. <coughs> the name of Rama? Rama? The name of Rama is the sacred name of the Lord. And along with the name comes the form. So when you use the name, it's like when you call your child, you know, the child responds. And when you think of your child, the name comes first and then the form. So also with the mantra, when we use the name, the form also comes, and along with the form come the qualities. So the mind becomes bathed in the presence. And the more we're aware of it, and the more we practice it, the more we become bathed in the presence. So it's a very sanctifying form of consciousness. The name of the Lord, the name of Rama. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is not a question, only a clarification. Okay. I completely misunderstood mantra as something given by guru during initiation and now from your talk I understand it is the name of God also is included in mantras. Am I right? Uh, in the mantra the name of God <coughs> is there and along with that is a bija. There are two aspects to the mantra. There's the impersonal mantra and then there's the personal. So there is the form of God, and there are also the impersonal aspect. And uh, the personal uh, uh, bija uh, is the sound symbol of the name, of the form of God. You see, our mantras uh, come from the tantra tradition, where the bija mantra is the sound body of the aspect of God that we worship. So Rama has a special bija. <clears throat> Sometimes certain aspects of God have several beaches. Ramakrishna would have several beaches because he's the embodiment of all gods and goddesses. When they worship him as Kali, <coughs> when they worship him as Christ, when they worship him as Krishna. So he would have the uh, beach appropriate to that aspect of God that would be uh, particularly cherished by us. So the mantra has uh, the impersonal mantra, the bija mantra relating to the person, <coughs> and then there is uh, the actual name of God, and uh, uh, a word associated that uh, gives meaning to the mantra. <clears throat> and uh, the mantras uh, that are used in our tradition, there are eight altogether, and they have come down from Ramakrishna himself. And they related to mantras that he used in his spiritual practices, he handed them down to Sarada Devi, and she in turn handed them down to the president of the order, Swami Vrajananda. So they're used by our Swamis. They're considered very, very powerful. But is it essential? It should be given by a guru, or a um, devotee can pick up himself, because we know the names of the God. The, in a tradition, such as a, well, you can take a mantra, but usually a mantra is given. And why? Because with the mantra, there is the, the, transmi the transmission of the lineage as well. So you receive the whole power the coming from the Supreme Guru, Sri Ramakrishna. The power of that mantra that was used by him and handed down. So it comes. Religion is something that is transmitted. But well, supposing a person is in a remote place and there are no gurus around, if they have the desire to practice. It's more efficacious if one receives it from a teacher from an authentic tradition. And uh, <clears throat> usually when a desire has great yearning, things open up. And the impossible becomes possible. Yeah. Swami Swahananda was known to give the mantra by telephone. He had it several prisoners. It several, can be done. Several prisoners in the Texas prison system, and you know they couldn't come to see him. He couldn't go there, and so he gave the mantra orally through the phone, and sent the beads, the mala, less the mala, and sent that on its way as well. 
But that's only in dire circumstances. That is. It's best if the uh, recipient is there and uh, receives a full darshan of the initiation. Thank you. So we've gone through six stages, and I want to um, <clears throat> just go on to the seventh and the eighth stage of the mantra, and then we will we'll do an overview of the last talk. The seventh uh, stage is what is called a mantra shakti, when the mantra becomes living. And this is not uh, something that can be taken lightly. This is something where the devotee feels that the mantra is an entity in itself. It's a, a living entity within. And when the mantra becomes living, there becomes full consciousness of the presence of the chosen ideal and uh, various aspects of that chosen ideal, whether it's an aspect of Brahman, a glimpse of Brahman, or an aspect of the divine Shakti, whatever it may be. My teacher, when he went to Vrindavan, something very <coughs> unexpected happened to him. As he entered within the city, the mantra began to come of its own accord. He felt a great upliftment, and these are his own words. The whole atmosphere is surcharged with a sweet feeling of love there in Vrindavan. It affected me for a little while like an intoxicating drink. We were there for four nights, and the peculiarity of the place is that the tongue began to utter the name of the Lord without any attempt on my part. And it went on all the while except when I was sleeping. I thought what a blessed state it was. But as soon as I left the place, that intoxication was over. So along with this mantra shakti comes a, an ecstatic state. It's not a, necessarily an overtly ecstatic state. It can be a quiet ecstatic state, but it is a state of consciousness that is, is, is higher. And along with that mantra shakti, mm -hmm. the presence of the chosen ideal is uh, clearly felt and everything that that means. It's felt inward and outward. You see, when we experience the Lord in the heart, we also experience the Lord outside of ourselves. For example, how we view ourselves, when that changes, so also is the way we view the world. When we were a child, Everything was food, something we put in our mouths, yes? Little infant. And then we become a teenager, the world looks different. And then we become a young adult, and suddenly there's a different, we have more responsibility, things look different, We're, we become protective of our children. See, our sense of self has changed from the child to the parent. So also in spiritual life, when our sense of self changes and we begin to feel a deeper relationship with our chosen ideal, the world changes. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> How many of you are familiar with Julie Bolt Taylor's experience? Yeah. Okay. She was a neuroscientist. And... Uh, uh, neuropsychologist, and she had a stroke that lasted for several hours. And during that stroke, the left side of her brain shut down. And the experience she had was comparable to an experience of the pranic universe, the universe of vibration. But along with that experience, if you Google her name, you will find that her sense of self was also changing. She tried to call 911, and the numbers on the phone became just digital images, little dots, and then vibrations. 
and the room around her became a vibration, a room of vibrations. This concrete world of matter became a world of vibration, but simultaneously, along with that, she had an experience of herself as though she were swimming, as though she were like a whale swimming in the ocean. Reminds me of Sri Ramakrishna taking M to a pond and telling him to look at the fish. And he said, if you want a meditation on the impersonal, look at that fish swimming. That is an impersonal meditation. And so also as this world, this material world around her began to disintegrate into a world of vibration, her sense of self changed various levels of self. And so also in spiritual life, what she experienced was not a high state, it was the pranic universe. But nevertheless, her sense of self changed and it had a transformative effect on her life. It spiritualized her life. And so also, when we take up spiritual life, we have glimpses of reality. It may come in the form of a very holy dream, or we may have a very calm and serene upliftment of the mind, where we have a glimpse of reality, of this world that is different. We see it more as a shadow, a phantom existence. And then along with that experience, the experience of the self becomes predominant. We cannot have the outer experience without the inner experience. Because the inner experience is what articulates the outer experience. It is what defines it for us. You see? So as we change, the way we view the world changes. And it happens almost unconsciously. But as we practice and as we progress, Things do not appear to us to be the same, of the same value. And other things appear to be of more value. And we also find that when we read the scriptures, scriptures that we may be reading every day, that new meaning comes from pages that we have read and reread and re-reread. So as we progress in spiritual life, meaning from the scriptures, we receive new meaning in the scriptures. Our sense of self articulates this world for us. So this mantra shakti can both be with form or without form. But the meditator feels that the heart of the universe is within. This heart is really the center of consciousness. And it is a center whose circumference is everywhere. And its center is everywhere. It is without time and space. It is a world within worlds within worlds. We call it the heart, but when we enter and become absorbed, this world vanishes. See, there is no high, nor low, no front, no back, but it is five fingers up from the navel and in the center of one's heart. Not the anatomical heart, but in the very center, deep near the spine, near the kundalini current. Swami Shraddhananda, every object and event in the cosmos will be perceived and will be seen to function in the great reality, which is the mantra. This is the mantra Shakti. And the mantra is experienced as radiant light of consciousness. That consciousness pervades the mind, pervades our prana, and floods our heart with peace. It's so all pervading. So these are some of the experiences of the mantra. 
Now Swami Shraddhananda was a Gyani. He said, the mantra clearly reveals the deepest reality of the self. He had a mantra which he received from Swami Shivananda. And it was at the form of God, but it also had the impersonal aspect. The mantra clearly reveals the deepest reality of the self. Mantra Chaitanya, the divine consciousness of the mantra, and Atma Chaitanya, the divine consciousness of the Atman, become one. So there is no doubt that through the mantra we attain the highest. We have the vision both of the personal and the impersonal reality. And at that point, the repetition of the mantra is no longer necessary. When I used to visit him in Sacramento, his rosary would be around the picture of his guru. He said, now he has to do the mantra for me. Be hanging on the wall. The mantra is no longer necessary. The repetition of the mantra in a systematic way is no longer, it's constant. Constant mantra shakti. And finally, the eighth stage, the realm of Shabda Brahman, that no words can describe, where forms have become formless, the aspiring becomes mute, and the mind is transcended altogether. Swami Ashokananda said, when Om is pronounced rightly, the entire universe comes with it and is swallowed up. And that's a state of nirvikalpa samadhi. So this is to inform our practice, give us faith in our practice. We're here because we want to we want to change. We want to become our best self. We want to maybe realize God. We may even just want to become happier. We're here for that reason. But to achieve those things, we have to practice. And now we're coming to mantra with meditation. To we have already talked about the metaphysical science of the mantra coming from Svotavata, and you can read about it in Bhakti Yoga, Swami Vivekananda's Bhakti Yoga. We talked about this in the first uh, lecture, which gives you the whole science behind the mantra. We've talked about the practice of the mantra some of the experiences that come through the mantra, the stages of the development of the individual aspirant with the mantra. Let's talk now about how we use the mantra in our meditation. <clears throat> okay. Why do we use Om? Why is Om so sacred? Why not why don't we use words like peace or love or joy? Well, first of all, this OM is something that has been seen and heard. The anahata, the unstruck sound. We're not using mantras that have not been revealed. You see? That is why they have a power. And when they're transmitted through a lineage, they have more power. So <clears throat> we were edit editing uh, one of, uh, I'm working on a book right now, and the author had used uh, the phrase, so-and-so took a mantra. And we changed it. No, it's, you never take a mantra. You receive it. It's a gift. It's given to you three times, and you three times you repeat, and that cements the contract. And along with that come beautiful meditation instructions that help you systematize your practice. So it comes from a lineage which gives it power. It's like a channel of water that comes from the Ganges. 
how much more purifying it is than taking water from a faucet, just an ordinary faucet. So it's coming from a source, and with that source comes <coughs> So Sri Ramakrishna is the supreme guru. There is no human guru. He is the supreme, and beyond him is Satchitananda guru. <clears throat> Our human gurus never claim to be the guru. The guru is Sri Ramakrishna, Sardhidi. In fact, the initiation ceremony is handing the disciple over to Sri Ramakrishna and Sardhidi. It's a beautiful, simple ceremony. Now, how is the mantra incorporated into an aspirant's meditation? Well, all words as we talked are consciousness. All forms are consciousness. This world is Consciousness of names, names and forms. Consciousness behind names and forms. This world as an illusion. Yes, but behind that illusion is pure consciousness. And within the forms of you is consciousness. If Sri Ramakrishna were sitting here, which he is, he's seeing you all as divinities. Aspects of divinities. They see you as a glass house, your persona. All of our personas, which we take to be so real, literally it means mask. The space is a mask. It's something we, we put on from our subtle mind. It has formed a concrete mask. But inside is the light of the Atman. So there's, these forms I see outside of me, you're a higher form than the carpet or a table. You're a, a higher form of consciousness, a greater manifestation of consciousness. Okay. So the mantra is a radiant light of consciousness. It's divine consciousness, Shabda Brahman. And it issues from the source of the universe. So these mantras, again, I repeat, have been revealed through the Sound that cannot be heard with the outer ear. Okay. And both the Tibetan and the Shakta traditions, it's possible to hear all sounds as the mantra. Hearing all sounds as proceeding from the sacred realm, <coughs> the sound experience. Okay. How the mantra is incorporated into meditation is a process of gradual purification of the mind, and it leads to a systematic concentration of the mind, absorption, then union, what we call samadhi. <clears throat> How can the mind be quieted by the mere name of God? One of you were telling me, it's my mind, I find it very, very difficult to calm it. Ramana Maharshi says, when japa becomes continual, continuous, all of the thoughts cease, and one is in one's real nature, which is dhyana, meditation. We turn our mind outwards on things of the world, and are therefore not aware of our real nature being always japa. When by conscious effort of japa or dhyana, we prevent our mind from thinking of other things, then what remains is our real nature, which is japa. This is the sound body of God. Ram Prasad sang, I have tied the divine name of Mother Tara in a tuft of hair in my head. I am ready to depart from this world singing the name of Durga. Okay, what does this mean? The name tied to the tuft of hair on the head implies the name of God is intimately present in all three states of consciousness, waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. So that's the symbolic meaning. And for Ram Prasad, the distinction between the Divine Mother and her name had disappeared. 
complete absorption in the vibratory presence of the Divine Mother through Japa. Even distractions are manifestations of the Divine Mother. He's saying, all that you hear are indeed mantras of the Divine Mother. See? And so we try to turn our distractions. It's called spiritual jujitsu. When distractions arise, flood them with a mantra. That's a time when we become aware of the distractions. That's a time we can raise counterthoughts. What's a wonderful counterthought? The mantra. Raise it like a tsunami inside of ourselves and send it dashing against the distracting thoughts. Swami Shraddhananda, the world of sound is heard as a cosmic and spiritual reverberation of the aspirant's mantra. Verily, all this universe is Brahman. That's an experience. And so an aspirant would see that as the manifestation of the mantra. But the mantra must be practiced with faith and concentration, dedication, regularity. See? Why do they keep harping on regularity of practice? Anybody know? Why? In the Eternal Companion, we always hear about regularity of practice. That was one of my big questions as a young man. Why do we have to be so regular? Is it because it <coughs> Our mind gets wired, like... The mind becomes wired and it becomes a habit. habit. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that there is a momentum, a spiritual momentum that's built up. And when we <coughs> cut that short, when we stop doing our practice, we just reap the consequences. We have to... We go back traveling sometimes, abruptly, uh, ends the practice, our regularity becomes disrupted, so we lose that momentum, and then we go back to our practice, mm -hmm. and then we rejuvenate it. So <clears throat> those things, if we can be aware of those things, that encourages us to be more regular in our practice. We talked yesterday about the two ends of the battery, morning and evening, and if we can meditate in that fashion, there's like a current that we feel throughout the day and they became, become like two <clears throat> battery ends that are keeping us joyous throughout the day. So the Yoga Sutras they, <clears throat> and the Tantra Sutras speak about the six spiritual centers in the body. And we also find this in the, um, Upanishad, in the Upanishads. As Sri Ramakrishna explained that the heart is the best center of concentration. Some people are drawn to the head, but that can be dangerous. Even Swami Virajananda, who was an adept in meditation, he ran into trouble by meditating in the head, in the third eye. Mother said, when she found out, she said, oh, did I tell you to meditate there? No, meditate here. <clears throat> Swami Shraddhananda. Usually in the heart, we visualize a full blooming lotus, lotus of the heart. It's the, the seat of the Lord. It's luminous. Swami Shraddhananda, by repeating the mantra, the aspirant should first think that the mantra is purifying the seat of the ishta and making it radiant. What spiritual imagination? Swami Shraddhananda was extremely creative, a very creative writer, and he was a very creative meditator. He drew on the spiritual imagination, and that spiritual imagination made deep inroads into his mind and his spiritual life. And so also, if we turn to our inner resources and develop our own spiritual imagination, <clears throat> See? Whatever situation we're in, we turn to our own resources and create our own spiritual imagination 
to enrich our meditation. The student should seek and ask about that inner abode. <clears throat> now there's a beautiful description of that inner abode in the Chandogya Upanishad, and many of you are already familiar with that. It goes, within the city of Brahman, which is the body, this is the city of Brahman, there is the heart, and within the heart, there is an abode. It has the shape of the lotus, and within it dwells that which is to be sought after, inquired about, and realized. Now there are some people who have problems <coughs> meditating in the heart. It's hard <coughs> to imagine the Lord seated in the heart. So it's very hard to put the mind there. And so what some of our teachers suggest is that imagine a stalk coming from that lotus out and a lotus outside of yourself in front of you and your chosen ideal seated before you facing him. But at the end of the meditation, then bring that back into the heart because everything is coming from the heart. Everything is coming from that seed of consciousness. <clears throat> Swami Shodananda. The experience of hearing the mantra and seeing the ishta is unified in consciousness. The state of mind in which these two different experiences become one is called pragya or pure, pure comprehension, pure knowledge. In the Katu Upanishad, it says the self is realized only through prakya, so knowledge, unified knowledge, which is the same as pure love, where the lover and the beloved become one. There's a beautiful description. In one of the Upanishads, the body is like a lower piece of wood. And Om is an upper piece of wood. And with the repetition of Om with faith and contemplation on the meaning, it's like rubbing together two pieces of wood. See, all of these are hooks that the Upanishads and scriptures give us so that we can use our own spiritual imagination. to raise our mind to subtler and subtler levels of consciousness. <clears throat> and by rubbing those two sticks of wood together, self-knowledge is kindled. The fire of self-knowledge is kindled by the friction of the word. It is said in the Upanishad that all sounds spring from the ultimate primal sound, which is Om. Om is a totality of existence. It's the word symbol of Brahman. Swami Shraddhananda, again, beautiful spiritual imagination. While repeating Om, the meditator should think that the self Hidden in the body is like the latent energy of heat in the wood. By the practice of repeating Om, the fire of self-knowledge is ignited. It was beautiful. There's another beautiful visualization in the Mundaka Upanishad. It's one of my favorites. It reads, affixed to the Upanishad, the bow incomparable, the sharp arrow of devotional worship. Then with a mind absorbed and heart melted in love, draw the arrow and hit the mark, the imperishable Brahman. 
It goes on. Om is the bow. The bow. The arrow is the individual being. And Brahman is the target. With a tranquil heart, take aim. Lose thyself in him, even as the arrow is lost in the target. So imagine yourself. Om is, is Brahman is the target. The chosen ideal is the target. For is that not the symbol of Brahman? And your mantra is the bow. And you feel as though you are entering the chosen ideal. What a beautiful, beautiful spiritual visualization that gives such juice to our meditation. It gives such force and motion and momentum to our meditation. Sometimes we feel just that we need a new way. It's another way of approaching our chosen ideal. So this imagery of shooting at the target with a bow and arrow is very, very helpful. In the Mundaku Upanishad, Om is indeed all this. All that is past, present, and future is indeed Om. And whatsoever transcends past, present, and future, that also is Om. So what is true of Om also applies to other mantras. Swami Shradhananda again. The Ishta of the mantra, the chosen ideal of the mantra, placed on the chosen ideal during contemplation, leads first to a vivid, living presence of the personal aspect of God, and then finally merges into the soundless realm. Vivid, living presence. My teacher used to say, the secret of meditation is to f try to feel the presence of your chosen ideal. Try to feel the presence. That brings in the impersonal aspect of your meditation. Not just to see the form, but try to feel the presence. You have a presence. You have a presence. You have a presence. If Sri Ramakrishna were to walk through the store, we would feel his presence before we even saw his form. I remember my first trip to India. Before even seeing the temple of Puri, Jagannath, before we had even turned the corner to see the temple, we could feel the atmosphere of the temple. Same with Kanyakumari. Same with all of those great ancient temples. The atmosphere is there. And so with these divinities, their atmosphere is manifest. So to try to inject that into your meditation, trying to feel that, even if it's for a split second, that gives a tremendous aug augmentation to your meditation. Not just repeating necessarily the mantra, but also trying to generate what would it be like if my chosen ideal were standing in the room? How would I feel? What would I do? There's a beautiful story of Bhavatarani, and you may be familiar with her. Uh, she was, some of our nuns met her in India when they went in 49. She was a little girl uh, when she went to see Sri Ramakrishna. And she went into his room, and she said, who are you? He was seated on his cot. And suddenly, 
his form disappeared and there was only light. And Baba Tarani, she climbed up in his lap, trying to find, there was a fragrance, trying to smell where the fragrance was coming from and just it was a just luminous form of light. She said, Takur, Takur, who are you, who are you? Later in her life, she forgot the experience. She got married. Later, the experience came back to her when she was a young woman. She thought, I had that experience. Let me go back and ask Takur what happened. Mm -hmm. So she went back to Dakshineshwar, mm -hmm. and she walked into his room where he was sitting on his cot. And she said, Takur, what happened then? Who are you? Are you Bhagavan? And again his form disappeared in light, beautiful smile. And again she had felt the ecstasy of his divine presence. So like that, we are meditating on a form of God, but it is luminous. It is pure consciousness. And along with that form comes a presence. And that presence is pure love. That presence loves us more than we could ever know. Pure love. Unconditional love. So when we use our mantra, try to approach like the arrow to penetrate the target, it's good for us to remember that this form of God melts into the formless, that ananda which is sat, which is also chit, that ananda which is bliss, which is love. Swami Brahmananda said, first worship the chosen ideal mentally with flowers, incense, etc. and then practice meditation and mental jumping. So you can do a mental worship. So he probably went on to say, bring a basin of water, a gold basin of water, and bathe the Lord's feet. And garland the Lord with flowers of qualities that you would like to have, that you see in your beloved, that you also would like to have. Wave incense and light and even dance before your beloved because that is the restlessness of the mind. The dancing is restlessness of the mind. And you're offering the light of consciousness back to that which is the light of all consciousness, the light of this world. See? So in that way, by offering a mental worship, what we do in our worship, then it steadies the mind. And Mother said, if you have a hard time, you know, keeping the mind on the form, begin by meditating on the feet and go up the body, to the arms, to the hands, to the eyes. And then bring the mind's eye back down to the feet. So you trace the figure to keep the mind steady on it but also bring in your spiritual imagination. We bring, in, we bring in a conversation with God. We talk to God. That's another way of calming the mind. Not just, oh thou, oh thee, but Lord, see, I'm having a hard time controlling my mind. And please, you control it. I'm, it's beyond my control. He's nearer than the nearest. He hears the prayer before it even arises in our mind. He knows the desire. That is the strongest form of prayer. The yearning. As you meditate on your chosen ideal, this is Brahmananda, think of him as bright and effulgent, and that everything shines because of his light. Think of him as living and conscious. And as you continue thus, the form of your chosen ideal 
will gradually melt into the formless, into the infinite, then will follow a vivid sense of the living presence, until finally the eye of wisdom will open and the infinite will be directly perceived. Ah, that is an other realm, far beyond this universe. After this experience, the universe appears as nothing. The mind is dissolved and you experience Savikalpa Samadhi. This leads gradually to the realization of the Nirvikalpa Samadhi, absolute union with God. This experience is beyond all thought and speech. There is nothing to be seen, nothing to be heard. All is infinite silence, beyond duality and non-duality. I'd like to end here and invite questions. Yeah. Mataji, um, Mantra Shakti, if we chant mantra in a shrine and chant mantra in the house, and chant mantra in a holy place, is the Shakti dependent on the place where you chant? Well, their temples are very uh, sacred, you see. They help us. And also meditating with other people helps our meditation because there's a current, a spiritual current. Yes. And our swamis often tell the monastic community to meditate together, that is why. So there's a more potent form. And remember Jesus said, wherever, one, wherever two are gathered in my name, you see. So there's that, the communal, and also the, this, this is a, a sacred space of sacred vibration. So it's very efficacious to meditate here. Mantra Shakti is an experience. The, 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 the mantra <coughs> itself has power, but when the mantra is awakened, that's called Mantra Shakti. In the meantime, we repeat the mantra and have faith that there is tremendous power, the light of consciousness. See, that's how we, we, the, perf the seed of perfection is in the practice. These practices are based on the results. First come the revelation and then comes the practice. And that's why it's very dangerous to take up practices from other religious traditions that are not based on our own spiritual premise. So... So, mantra shakti awakens and flowers through practice, where the living presence is felt, where the mantra becomes living. And in the meantime, we go on repeating and purifying the mind. I have one question, Mataji. I mean, uh, so you, you talked about the, so I have two. The what? Well, I have two questions, basically. Uh, so, so you talked about the tantric tradition, the source as a tantric tradition in the Ramakrishna order, as well as, a, as could you elaborate a little bit, a little bit more on the pragya? Okay, uh, tantra. You understand what tantra is? Yes. Tantra means mantra with a seed word. Mm -hmm. okay. It also means mother worship, okay. and it also means guru. Guru mantra and mother worship. So, so in our worship, ours is not a Vedic worship. It is a tantric worship that is non-dual. <coughs> okay. And it uses bija, bija seed words, which are very powerful. So it's a science of the mantra, the metaphysical science of mantra. Okay. Now, the second part of your question? The second was, uh, could you elaborate a little bit on the pragya side? I mean... I mean, how does it, I mean, will you elaborate a little bit more? I mean, I mean. As we use the mantra, we gain spiritual insight. And that is why when we go to meditate, whether we know it or not, a small portion of the kundalini arises, rises. 
And that is why our teachers say, be very careful about rising from your seat of meditation and engaging in trivial conversation or uh, argumentation or any kind of thing that would be jarring to the system. Because many times the experience, if an experience is to come, it'll come later. It won't necessarily come in the shrine. So when experience comes, that's knowledge. But that knowledge comes with love. Our devotion. You see? Knowledge and devotion, the apex of both, is the same. When the lover becomes one with the beloved, there's oneness. With knowledge, there becomes union between the knower and the known. Mm -hmm. I can ask a question. I understand that uh, mantra and japa essentially helps to calm the mind or overpower the vibrations of the mind to, to make that's it calm. One of its, that's one of that's, its uses. Uh -huh. But the other, other aspect is, is that the mind itself is programmed in a way that it is impossible to control. So the ideal way, or at least from that perspective, is to withdraw it, withdraw yourself from, because every effort to control the mind is like a whack-a-mole. Uh, is you know? this a statement or a question? It's a, I mean, so how do you view it uh, in terms of uh, contradictory viewpoint of uh, withdrawing from the mind, because controlling mind is not possible. This how do you withdraw from the mind? You tell me. Well, I mean, that is a theory. Do you have that capacity? No, you don't. I mean, but the, the basic theory okay. is... Basic so if you can't withdraw from the mind, what is, the, what, what is useful? What is a useful spiritual tool? To no, purify the mind? Well, and the, then transcend the mind? Well, that is a question that how does one transcend the mind by withdrawing? That is a theory of one of the theories that you withdraw from it because you are conscious that you are not the mind mm -hmm. and you are witnessing the mo currents of the mind. There are, there are different techniques. The Gyani technique would be to withdraw from the mind. Precisely the point. But very, very few people are able to separate the self from the body. See? We, we feel a stomach ache. Mm -hmm. We, um, you know, we get angry. We get happy. We identify with the mind. Very few people are qualified to be following the path of Adoita. But at the same time, Adoita gives us that ability to sharpen our discrimination, to sharpen our logic and analysis, not just to banter words back and forth, but if we're really aware of the difference between the seer and the seen, to take that conviction with us and to use that sometimes. You see, the beauty of Vedanta is that sometimes I may feel more in a jnani mood. At the time of sunset, I may feel more like withdrawing the mind. Why not? Vedanta offers a smorgasbord. There's no one way. We use all to keep our religion broad and fresh and to give us a well-rounded and balanced personality development. We use all of our tools, all of the arrows in our quiver. But at the same time, we use a very useful tool of purifying the mind with higher consciousness, the mantra. Purifying and elevating the mind through meditation. Without meditation, we're just fooling ourselves. Without that period of calmness in the day, it's just talk. We're not really changing. We're just talking high philosophy. We can tell the difference between practitioners, however simple they may be, when they're really practicing. I had one very stark lesson when I joined the convent. There was a woman who was from the Midwest, and she was very poorly educated. And she was staying in our gatehouse. Her sister was really saintly, and she was married to a, a, a man who uh, 
finally requested initiation towards the end of his life. But her sister was very saintly. But Ruth was just the salt of the earth. You know? she, uh, she talked very plainly. And in my opinion, she, she thought very plainly. And one day she invited me into her bedroom in our gate house, which is now a bookstore. And I was absolutely awestruck by her shrine. Her shrine was living. It was pulsating consciousness. I thought, my God, this woman has a depth that I never knew. I was so struck by her photographs that were, that there was such a vibration in her shrine. And my, all of my preconceived notions about Ruth were just dashed to the ground. Here was a woman who really practiced deeply. She had a depth to her. And I developed a tremendous respect for her. Whereas others who may be very well educated, highly read, but there's no depth. The questions are superficial. There's no real depth. See? So without meditation, there's no depth to our spiritual life. And without karma yoga, how do we know where we are in spiritual life? When we rub up against others, then that's the test. If we live alone in a cave, we never know. You know? <clears throat> We have this idea that what we are, but until we are out there walking the walk, we're not testing our spirituality. That's the field of action, is where we find out who we really are. You know? When I, when I throw a broom to one side, I find out I have disrespect for the articles of my worship. I learn more quickly through karma yoga. And it's the hardest yoga. Hardest yoga. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think you answered the question. I mean, another question if I ask, how does one get initiated? You asked the question on Friday, are you initiated? Exactly does that mean in terms of how you use it? Um, in our tradition, uh, there are spiritual leaders. For example, the spiritual leader of this center is Swami Sarvadevananda. And he's the head of the Banana Society of Southern California. And uh, you request initiation. And he has some requirements, reading requirements. You should know the lives of Ramakrishna, Mother, and Vivekananda. And also a little bit of Bhakti Yoga. What we have discussed here about the metaphysical science of the mantra, and also the qualifications of the guru and the qualifications of the disciple. Swami Vivekananda clearly lays out. You ask, and then he will tell you when and if he will initiate you. And then what happens in initiation is a very simple ceremony, and it generally takes about an hour. And uh, during that time, you're offered to Sri Ramakrishna and Sarya Devi. They are the gurus. And then meditation instructions are given according to your particular preference. Your chosen ideal may be different than mine. And then the mantra is given privately. And there's a very simple ceremony that takes place with flowers and fruits. Flowers are offered and fruits are given. Uh, there are other wonderful books. For example, Christopher Isherwood's book on Ramakrishna and his disciples. That's wonderful. Or the, the introduction to the Gospel of Ramakrishna that gives the life of Ramakrishna in very, very good English. Also, Nikhilananda's Life of Holy Mother. He was a disciple of Mother. The book is a little larger, but it's a beautiful uh, uh, biography. So it depends on, on your taste and what you, what you would like to do. But, um, so those are those are the options. Yes. Mataji, how does the meditation everywhere 
than a seed in one place. What was the question? How dangerous the meditation everywhere than sitting in one place? How dangerous? How dangerous? Dangerous. Is dangerous. dangerous. You have to meditate sitting in one place that you can. Uh, everywhere. Mm -hmm. Everywhere, like every time, anywhere, like everywhere, every day. It could be any 24 hour cycle. So instead of sitting one place, mm -hmm. so how, to be, how dangerous could be meditating yes. everywhere? Well, it's good to meditate in the morning in one place reg with regularity because when you are seated quietly, the mind becomes more concentrated. Now, if you can't sit for a long time, start with five minutes. Start with five minutes and then do that for a period of time and then try to increase it to ten minutes. And then throughout the day, there are little apps on your phone that can go off. <laughs> One of our swamis prescribed in the middle of the day, take five minutes time out to recollect, to sit quietly maybe during your lunch break if you're at work, and try to, to, to go within your heart and sit quietly through prayer and so forth. And then at the end of the day, another five or ten minutes. Not the limit of five or ten minutes. When I lay down and meditate, I don't have enough time. Like, I need more time like more hours, but I have no time to meditate because of other things to do, like more busyness. So, so busy, so I cannot make that much time to sit in one place. So what's my option is? You have a family. Yeah. I, would, I would say take five or ten minutes out. For every, my preparation is, is not enough for your five, ten or one hour. Five or ten minutes. I would start with five or ten minutes. And do what you can do. Once there was an old man who joined the monastery and he knew he could not sit in meditation. But he concentrated on what he could do. And he put photographs of all of the direct disciples in his room. And he spent a little bit of time in front of each picture looking at the eyes. He knew he couldn't sit with, with eyes closed, but he went around the room and he spent three minutes, three minutes, three minutes. That was his meditation. So concentrate on what you can do. Actually, my, I need time, like bigger time for my meditation, I see. That's my experience. Start with a little bit of time and but then build it. Little bit time when I try to enter by the door, like. Just step in the door, then I have to come back, you know. But I know go inside the door and spend the day or you know enough time I need it because this time I see around me is like nothing, you know. And then I forget the wall when I try to forget the wall, you know, go enter and then somebody pull me out. I have to go and rush and this well, and that. I would just make sure that your family knows yeah. that this time is set aside. You go in the door. And you sit, and that time is yours. Mm -hmm. And no one disturbs you. You work with your family so that they know, and it benefits the family when someone in the family is meditating. It benefits the whole family. Yeah, that's true. So concentrate on what you can do and then expand on that. Any, any other questions? Yes. Well, that in your previous uh, lecture this morning, you mentioned with the um, intense sadhana, you can um, remove the karma. Yes. Is it possible? But most yeah. of the scriptures... You say mitigate the karma. Mm -hmm. The japa, through japa, you mitigate the karma. I see. Yes. Um, but some say you have to um, kill the consequences of the karma. There, there is no way to remove karma. Well, if you were going to have your hand chopped off, you'd be pricked by a, a, by a rose thorn instead. <laughs> it would be mitigated to an extent. You see, when we are performing spiritual practice, we're not only going towards the Lord, we're unwinding karma. Unwinding karma. Sometimes we're reaping the effects of karma even faster because we are on the spiritual path. See? 
Well, and here, even the great uh, sages, even Ramakrishna suffered from... He didn't really suffer. No. <laughs> yeah, he said he didn't suffer, no. but it happened to him. And we've seen in the lives of ordinary aspirants, gosh, a wonderful uh, man in Dallas. Um, he's Catholic, he's Roman Catholic. And uh, his first book was the Lila Prasanga, the great master. And he was absolutely captivated by Ramakrishna. He looks upon uh, Ramakrishna as Christ. And he was diagnosed with uh, cancer of the bladder. His family members were totally distraught. You know, he was just very matter of fact. He felt elevated. He felt elevated. There was no fear. Sri Ramakrishna blessed him. In spite of the karma, his mind was elevated. So it didn't have the effect. He went through his chemo, came out, carried on. But the people around him fell apart. But he, he, you see, he was bearing what karma he had, but his, he had transcended the karma. See? And so also, as spiritual aspirants, when we are faced with obstacles, it's the matter of how we use those obstacles. Those obstacles become spiritual incentives. They become doors of opportunity, you see? So they don't have the same sting. They become methods, they become our tapasyas. They become our sadhanas. See? So they're no longer obstacles. So illness can become a sadhana. Or a tragedy can become a sadhana. See, in mother's life, when Sri Ramakrishna passed away, tremendous grief spurred her on, and she had vision after vision of the Master. That grief was transformed into tremendous yearning for God. And I have seen that in ordinary devotees. When they have been struck by the most traumatic tragedies in their lives, how they were able to transcend. Tragedy didn't go away, but they transcended. Extraordinary examples. So it's possible for all of us. That's the grace of spiritual life. Any other questions? Should I perform the R&D? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah.